So the recording has started. Okay, great. So in terms of interactions, um, I'd love everyone to share their name and affiliation, relevant experience, whatever that might be, and then one thing you love about Rentham. Okay, so Rachel, could you start us off? So your name and affiliation, um, some related experience, whatever that might be, and then one thing you love about Rentham. So Rachel Benson, I've met most of you via email. So good to see actual faces now. Um, I'm the town planner in Rentham. Um, let's see, one thing that I love about, oh, sorry, being the town planner is like my experience, I guess. <laughs> my qualification, we'll call it that. Um, one thing I love about Rentham um, was that it has a great mix of um, keeping the old New England quintessential feel um, along with um, some open space in the lands and farms. So um, it's, that was my favorite, my favorite parts about Rentham. And the people, you all are wonderful too. Great, thanks. Okay, next on my screen is Alan. There I am. <clears throat> I'm Alan Selling. I'm a member of the Open Space Committee and uh, been doing that about five years. Uh, I guess that's my experience. Before that, I was a small business owner. And before that, I was an engineer, worked for a lot of big corporations. So a little bit varied background. What I like about Rentham, well, moved here in 1990. I'm still here. So I think that says it all raise my children here, and uh, don't plan on leaving anytime soon. That's about it. Great, thanks. How about Jeff? Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Jeff Spratt. I am a 10-year resident of Rentham, a new member of the Economic Development Committee. Uh, I own a real estate property management company in East Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, so experience in uh, property management as well as real estate development. So that's probably my uh, sort of carryover skill, you know, market research on a, or master planning on a smaller scale when it comes to real estate developments. Um, I, you know, much like what uh, Rachel said, lovely community rent them quintessential New England. I think it's great as it is, but what I love the most, I think is the potential. I think uh, rent them could, is already a great town and I think has an opportunity, especially due to its proximity to Boston and, and Providence to really be a, a preeminent community in south of Boston. Great, Diane. Um, I am a retired commercial leasing attorney with some zoning experience. I was one of the in-house attorney when we tried to get the first CDS store in the center of Rentham and there was opposition to um, maintain the historic mobile gas station. So uh, being working full time, three kids, I've lived in Rentham for 35 years. And I remember my first time driving through Rentham. I just knew this was the town I wanted to live in. I'd moved from Canada and I just love the historical nature, the cemetery. I love cemeteries, um, the architecture. And um, I never had time to do much volunteer work with three kids, husband, working full time for a major corporation like CVS. So I have been retired for four years. I'm on the uh, Sohano uh, Garden Club with Selena. Then I got asked to be on the uh, landscape committee. Um, and we, Selena and I have been working tirelessly on helping to plant and weed and water. If you've noticed, sweat looks a little different. We we put perennials from our own gardens and got a lot of cooperation and help from the DPW. Uh, Ray Rose, great, got us a mulch and we had lots of people helping us to uh, spread it and at the library sign. So thank you, Ray Rose. Um, so I, yes, I, a long time ago, I started a, a proposal for a sidewalk on Creek Street and I was told it was in process, a T21 grant with the state. 
would follow up with the DPW every year. I won't mention his name. There was a file, supposedly. Richard Ross knew about it. Um, Mr. Brown, Scott Brown, one of our neighbors, because everybody knows everyone walks that loop, even now with baby carriages and more so. So I wanted to be on this committee because it seems like there's fine, it's very timely. Um, we can help improve the quality of this uh, beautiful town and part of it starts with more traffic lights for safety, um, walking paths, which I was all for the rezoning of downtown. Um, this is a great opportunity to control development in the future. So I'm really excited to be part of that. Thank you, Diane. Um, Lou. Hi, everyone. Um, it sounds like I'm the newbie here to uh, rent them. I grew up in Franklin, lived there for, gosh, many, many years, and moved here to Rentham in 2017 in October. Uh, I've um, had a business in Franklin for uh, 15 or so years, my own architecture firm. We had about 30 people, and um, a couple of years ago, we were acquired by a fairly significantly large firm um, headquartered out of Arkansas. So we went to 30 people to 250 people nationally. I'm part owner, there's one of six owners. Um, you know, as an architect, I've been involved in tremendous amount of properties, pr pr tremendous amount of development through the years. Um, I've got a lot of sort of land uh, planning um, and, and uh, master planning skills um, for a lot of the mixed use kind of developments we do. And we're not doing just small mixed use projects, we're doing projects you know, one and two million square feet in size. So there's a lot that goes into that. A lot of the strategies that are used, um, you know, in that are, uh, I find could be helpful. And, and sort of what got me into this a little bit. Oh, one thing too, I should say, when I was in Franklin, I was actually on the town. Uh, I was a planning board member for a number of years and I co-wrote the original design review guidelines for the town of Franklin. Um, so I've always had, um, I designed a couple of the war memorials on the town common. So I've always, as an architect, I always felt it was important to get involved in the community and give back. And I've got a lot of, uh, a lot of um, knowledge and skills that I'd, I'd love to share with the town of Rentham. Um, the, you know what kind of got me into this though was one of our clients reached out to us about doing a development in, in Rentham in the town. And it's in the property. I think that that's part of what this, this committee is gonna be talking about. It's right um, kind of behind the Main Street or or you know the the downtown, and we declined that project because I felt like um, I don't want to do something like that in my own town. And then suddenly mm -hmm. this opportunity came out, and I thought even better, because I know what developers are going to want to do, right? They're going to want to plunk in these boxes, do the minimal amount of effort, and I'd rather be on the other side of the table pushing back on that stuff. What I like mostly about Rentham, I like a lot of things, but what I really like is it's downtown. It's just beautiful. It's the town common is just stunning. Um, the, the town is walkable. And, and right now there seems to be plenty of parking. Uh, I'd like to see, see the town grow a little bit and, and add some new and exciting kind of uses. But um, that's what drove me to come here and be a part of this. Great. Thank you, Lou. We have a lot of different skills and experience already. This is great. Um, Jerry. Yeah, can you can you hear me okay, McGovern? Uh, Jerry McGovern. Oh, sorry, Jeff, you're up soon. <laughs> I'm Jerry McGovern. I'm on the board of selectmen. Um, I was on the master plan committee 19 years ago, uh, and in between then and now, I've been on a few other committees in town. So I've been uh, kind of involved in a lot of uh, of our local government and stuff, and that kind of leads to what I would say is um, one of the things I like about living here and, and, and particularly in volunteering here is the town is small enough, but has enough opportunities that it's not hard to make a difference. You can really change things uh, at the local level as, as opposed to when you get into higher uh, levels of government. So um, I know that this committee has been overdue for some time uh, and maybe that's good in a way because the town has made a lot of progress in the last five or six years about what it's willing to do to, to not be a 1960s town anymore without losing the charm and everything. So uh, there's no doubt we'll put a, a good um, product in place that will further guide it for the next 15 years or so. 
Great, thank you. George. Hi, uh, my name is George Labonte. I'm a lifelong resident of Rentham. Um, raising my four kids here now. I'm also the deputy chief of police uh, in the town. I was joking to say I should have got most likely to stay in area uh, while in high school. But um, I, I love this community. Great, thank you. Um, Everett. In Everett? Yep, yeah, I had Everett. to get unmuted. Um, yeah. uh, let's see, I moved to town in um, 75, uh, so I've been here a couple of years. I moved all the way from uh, Plainville, two miles away. Um, I've uh, got uh, 25 years experience in public works as a director of public works in two towns. Uh, Rentham and Framingham. Um, I've been on the planning board. I think this is the eleventh year. Um, before that, I was on the board of health. Uh, and my work experiences: I uh, also was a civil engineer doing land surveying for almost uh, twenty years. And I think Rentham's great. Great, thank you so much. And who's that cat next to you? That's uh, Clara Bell. Clara Bell. Is she yes. an engineer too? No, okay. Uh, yeah, she's, engineer, she's engineering, you, so she's gonna get to my uh, hearing aids that I have out because I have earbuds in. <laughs> oh no, okay. Selena, glad to join us. Sorry for the confusion. That's okay. Okay, so I'm Selena, and I moved to Rentham about three years ago from Plainville also. Um, I really like the town. It's a nice, quaint little downtown, which I want to keep that way. I'm on the garden committee. I'm on the landscape committee. I'm very into um, beautifying the town with flowers and trees. Um, and I would love to see more sidewalks. I live on um, A and Creek and I see people walking the loop around through the center all the time and I just worry about people walking on that road. Um, so I'm excited to see what's going to be happening and, um, you know, more open space. We've been doing work at Sweat Park which I see a lot of people using now, a lot of people going down there, teenagers, adults playing tennis, kids with, you know, their parents. So um, that's exciting. Uh, so, and the garden club's doing a lot of work in the town in the different gardens. So, um, you know, I'm excited for more, more improvements. Thank you. Jeff, plant. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, uh, Jeff, I'm getting some echo. I apologize. I'm having some trouble with the, uh, with the Zoom connection. Uh, but Jeff Plant, I've lived in town for 40 years. I um, think I'm following Billy Skinner's route. I actually grew up in Rentham. Um, sorry, I grew up in Plainville and moved to Rentham. Um, my wife grew up here in town. We've raised our kids in town. So um, obviously the town is very special to us. Um, the thing I like best about it is, is the culture and the people. Um, it's location and proximity to a lot of things going on, but also the diversity of what we offer in town. I mean, between our schools, open space, the different programs for anywhere from kids up to seniors and in between, uh, the facilities that we have. And I just really wanna try to see us help to look for the next 10, 15, 20 years and where we'd like to see the town to grow. 
Um, my background is I'm a registered um, civil engineer. I've been in the environmental health and safety field for 40 years, and I'm currently the director for a local uh, environmental health and safety consulting firm. Great, thank you. And Stephanie. Hi everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh great, okay. Um, my name's Stephanie Duquette. I'm a lifelong resident as well. Minus um, four years I lived in Florida and could not wait to come back and especially to Rentham. Um, it's just got the best of both worlds. It's got small town charm with easy access to the city. And I, I enjoy the, um, all the natural beauty that we have and i um, excited to be involved. When Rachel was putting this together, um, I was very eager to get involved and, and hope to add as much as possible to the group. I presently work at Town Hall in the Town Administrator's Office. I've had interaction with many of you, um, either over the phone or via email. And um, I look forward to um, being involved. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, did I miss anyone other than Ralph, my colleague at MAPC? Okay, uh, I'm Ralph Wilmer. I'm Technical Assistance Program Manager and Principal Planner at MAPC. I've, uh, I've been a planner for a long time both in the private sector and at MAPC uh, and have worked on a number of master plan projects uh, over the years. So I'll be working with uh, Ella on this and looking forward to working with all of you. Great. Thank you all again for the introductions. This is an exciting team. We have a lot of experience and skills and love of Rentham, obviously. Um, so next on the agenda is uh, the project overview. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen so we can all view the PowerPoint. And again, um, if somehow my sound cuts out, um, you can just chat me and we'll figure out a plan B. Okay. Great, and um, for this part of the presentation, I think I, I'll ask everyone to mute themselves until we get to uh, a discussion question. Or if you have a question, of course, unmute yourself, but there's a lot of folks on the call, so uh, there can be background sound. Okay, can everyone see um, this presentation? I'll, I'll go through it. Everyone's names here on the steering committee are here for your reference. Um, this is the MABC project team. So here are our names for your reference again. And Carolina will be joining for the next meeting and really leading the next meeting. In town staff. Okay, so project overview. What is a master plan? Obviously, some folks on this call know what a master plan is really well. Um, but just to provide a common understanding, the master plan, we hope will provide a strategic framework for the town to make its decisions, make its decisions related to policy, investments, and priorities based on a community vision. And so part of the master plan process is to try to have hard conversations and talk honestly and, and look at the facts and build consensus. So when the town needs to make a decision about an investment or a policy, we don't need to rehash all of those community conversations again. We know what the, the vision is and we can pursue it effectively. So um, hopefully the master plan will provide the town with a vision for the future, goals and strategies, and an action plan. This project isn't a full master plan. So a full master plan on the left-hand side, you'll see includes several different elements, um, some state required, some optional, from land use and housing to um, services and, and circulation. This is just a phase one, and we'll see if there's uh, further funding to do phase two, but MAPC is scoped just for phase one. So it includes a community visioning process, 
and identifying, you know, and putting into words the community vision, and then two elements. And the town has yet to choose which two elements will be included in this space. So we can, we'll surely talk about that at future meetings. So the timeline for this phase one is a year. So uh, June 2020 to June 2021. And there's basically two stages. One is the visioning and then the, the uh, development of the two elements. So we're doing existing conditions research. We'll do public outreach, including a survey and a community meeting. And then at the end of the visioning stage, we will have identified a vision and a discussion of issues and opportunities that the plan should address. And then in stage two, the plan development, we'll do more public outreach, likely stakeholder interviews. Um, and then we'll develop the two elements We'll do public outreach so we're so we know that those elements are really reflecting uh, the needs and addressing the needs of the community, and then we'll finalize the plan. That's the timeline. So now to turn to you all, the committee. and help represent different groups within the community. Ella, um, we, lost, we lost part of your, part of what you said early on. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. So I'll just start again from this slide. Great. So um, the committee is an important, plays an important role in advising the town throughout this process and advising MAPC to so providing input and guidance. Um, and to really help communicate between the town and MAPC and the community to make sure that uh, this whole process and plan stays on track. Um, and part of that is being plan ambassadors. And we really rely on the committee to uh, bolster public participation. Um, and again, the next entire meeting will be devoted to a community engagement plan so that we try our best to be inclusive and make sure the plan reflects the community's needs and the full breadth of the community's needs. In terms of logistics, um, as I mentioned earlier, you should have received an email with an introduction to something called ShareFile. And this can be cumbersome and annoying. I realize technology often is but it'd be great if you can try to log into ShareFile because we, we will be using it throughout the project. And just let me know if you have trouble, but we can troubleshoot it together. Um, we have a web page already developed and up and running. So we'll use that web page for communications with the public. And the web page is, there's a link in the agenda and um, I can share the link to the web page with everyone afterwards. Um, also in terms of logistics, we have four committee meetings scoped out, but certainly the role of the committee will expand far beyond just four committee meetings, including, you know, relying on the committee on leading the public participation and the outreach to the community and reviewing drafts of all of the documents. Great, Rachel has added the link to the web, the web page um, to the chat box. So check that out if you'd like. I also wanted to just notify everyone that it's best if we um, appoint or elect a chair and vice chair to call meetings to order and close, uh, you know, adopt the minutes and close the meetings and then a clerk to take minutes and distribute those minutes. So think about if you're interested in any of those offices, because this isn't yet an official meeting, we won't um, elect anyone today, but let us know if you're interested and, um, uh, either we'll choose these officers or we'll have an election. And another thing that the often at the very beginning of the process is name the plan. So again, this is a little tricky because it's just phase one, um, but we can develop a simple logo, which helps with 
uh, communicating and getting the word out of, about the plan. So I thought we could just spend about five minutes brainstorming some ideas of the name of the plan, and then the town will likely choose a name going forward. So I'm going to stop my screen. Does anyone have any uh, inspiring names that they think are catchy that would help people be interested in what we're doing here? Remember to unmute yourself. Just as uh, inspiration, we recently finished the Revere Master Plan, which was called Next Stop Revere. Um, we're doing a similar process to this in Winthrop, and they're calling it Win 2030. So um, just a couple of uh, ideas that might spur some others. Eller, I saw that you had both um, Vision and Tomorrow as two suggestions. I don't know, almost like the idea of vision for tomorrow as a potential. Great, vision for tomorrow. Okay, well maybe we'll work with that. Vision, rent them, vision for tomorrow. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, that was easy. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's uh, pray that they're all like that. Um, okay, great. So the next part of the presentation um, is about some of research we've done on existing conditions. And so there's a lot of charts, so a lot of data from the census and from the state. And so I realized that you all know all of this, you know, a lot more about the town than this data can show. And so that's why community part participation is so important to add some lived experience to these kinds of existing conditions analyses. But it can be helpful to just look at the numbers and have these, some of these numbers reflected back to you. And um, the hope is that they, you know, provide some insight into different lived experiences within town and maybe, um, some of the existing conditions will be surprising. So I'll show a few slides and then we'll talk about it and see if we learned anything new. Show a few slides and then talk about it some more. Okay, I'm gonna turn off my video and then share the screen again. Okay, so population and land use trends. So the population of Rentham, here's a chart of the historical population and today, it's about 12,000 people. And as you can see, um, there was a lot of growth in population in the 80s and 90s, you know, pretty sharp incline to the line. And then it's pretty much level, it hasn't leveled off, but the growth has, deep, has slowed down since 2000. In terms of age, like the whole region, um, the population is aging. So the median age over the past about 10 years has increased from about 41 to 43 years old. And this chart has two different lines. The first line, or the top line, shows the percentage of households with a senior or um, with, a, with a child in the household. And the bottom line shows percentage of households with a senior. So basically, the number of households with a kid has been decreasing, and the number of households with seniors has been increasing. In terms of race, it's a largely white community. 94% of the residents are white. And this chart um, provides some context by comparing it to the SWAP subregion. So some people might be familiar with that and some people not. The SWAP subregion includes 10, 10 towns, including Rentham, as well as its neighboring towns, to kind of help provide context for some of these numbers. So the whole subregion. Lost you again. 
Yeah, we lost your audio again. This chart shows, hmm, can you all hear me? Okay. Yeah. So this yeah. chart shows the percentage of households, uh, the language spoken at home. So again, the light green is Rantham and the darker green is the subregion. So the majority of people speak English at home, but 6% don't. That means one in 20 of your neighbors speak a language other than English at home. A majority of those households speak a European language, whereas in the subregion, there's more people who speak Spanish at home. In terms of education, it's a well-educated population. So this chart uh, shows the degrees that have been achieved. And if you combine the middle column and the rightmost column, that adds up to about 50%, meaning about 50% of the population has a college degree or higher. In terms of income, uh, the median household income is more than $100,000, so pretty affluent. But given that, um, the, the data is imprecise here, but somewhere between th 350 and 800 people um, so our neighbors live in poverty. And there's um, different definitions of poverty, but what this means is that those people are living on equivalent income of if they had four people in their house, they'd have to be making $24,000 in all. So if there was a family of four, so let's say two parents and two kids, that whole family would be living on $24,000. So that's what poverty means here. This is a similar poverty level to the subregion. So if, if we try to think about it in context. So I, um, I tried to dig deeper into these numbers to try to find out who are these people living in poverty. And it's hard to compare it to race and to see if there's any correlations there um, because there's such little da data. Um, and it could be seniors who are living on fixed incomes. And so it might not be a great measure of wealth, but they might just have lower income. But there seems to be a really big correlation between income and whether you're a homeowner or a renter. So the average income of a homeowner in Rentham is $127,000 a year. And the average income of a renter is about $30,000 a year. So that's a big difference in lived experience. Next, jobs. So this chart shows um, where residents are working. What kind of jobs do people have? So again, the bright green is Rentham and the darker green is the subregion. So comparing it to other nearby towns. <clears throat> So where you see the long bright green lines is where there are a lot of people working. So there's a lot of Rentham residents working in accommodation and food services, educational services, and retail. Those are the long green lines. And if you compare that to the darker green lines, you can see that people in the, in the subregion more generally, those jobs are spread out across more sectors. Whereas um, Rentham residents, there's a big concentration in these three industries of accommodation and food services, education, and retail. And it looks like we have Stephen Schwarm joining us. So and him. <clears throat> and I'll stop for a second so he can introduce himself. Hi, Steve. Um, hi. Hi, Stephen. Can you hear me? You're on mute. Just to let you know. Yeah, I'm sorry I'm late, but I missed it on my calendar. <laughs> no problem. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we've done introductions and some background on the project and some existing conditions. Would you mind introducing yourself, 
um, your name affiliation, um, related experience to planning, and then one thing you love about Rentham? Uh, well, I'm Steve Schwarm, and I'm a software engineer by profession, but I'm retired, supposedly. But the reason why I'm late is because I was working on a problem. And uh, I'm a member of the planning board and have been for a while. I've had some other interesting jobs at the, in town. I was the emergency manager for a while. And then I also worked on a no longer existing committee called the Earth Removal Advisory Committee for the Selectmen. But, um, and I've lived here for almost half my life. Thank and you. thank you. I've done a lot of planning with the planning board. <laughs> Rolling experience. Great, thanks. So I just have like one or two more slides to present, and then we'll talk about um, whether any of this has been surprising or what might be relevant to our work ahead. Okay, so right, so this was about um, where Rentham residents work, in which industries. This next slide is uh, the jobs in Rentham, so the employers. So on the left is all the types of jobs, industry, and then the first column is how many jobs there are in each industry. The second is um, number of firms in that industry. And then the third is how much money are they making per week? So I've highlighted in green the three industries that um, provide the most jobs in town. So that's accommodation and food services, educational services, and retail. And you'll see that those are also the industries that um, generally have lower wages. Not entirely, but generally have lower wages than other industries. I have a question about the chart. Yeah, please. Um, so these are people that work in Rentham. They're not necessarily residents because these wages don't match up at all with the average income in the town. That's right. Okay, just wanted to clarify that in my own mind. Thank you. Next, housing tenure. So although Rentham is a you know, beautiful, bucolic, small town, 15% um, of the homes are renter occupied, uh, which might be a surprise. Um, there's, I've included a lot of numbers here for background, but basically draw your attention to 13% of the units are subsidized, so they're affordable homes. Um, and, uh, it's a really, it's quite a stable population. So 92% of the residents lived in the same house a year ago. And those who lived in a different house moved from nearby, either moved within Rentham or um, the county. When you say 13% are subsidized, is that of the rentals or is total? Total. That's the so-called uh, 40B uh, percentage, 40B, uh, the affordable housing law in Massachusetts, which uh, stipulates that each community should try and get to 10% or more. Um, so that's what that uh, number represents. So we're, we're meeting that goal of 10%, exceeding it. So this is really similar to uh, what was pointed out earlier um, by Alan. So this is a cool map, basically the commute pattern. So the left-hand arrow says uh, 6,943. So those are the number of workers who commute into town to work. 468 residents live and work in town. And then almost 6,000 people live in town and commute out. So there's a lot of people commuting in and there's a lot of people commuting out and not too many people both living and working here.
And then in terms of projections, this is based on MAPC and uh, Massachusetts Department of Transportation's projections. But uh, the population is expected, the growth is expected to slow. So um, in the 90s, there was a 17% growth rate, and that's expe expected to slow to about 4%. Um, but notably, the percentage of seniors is expected to increase. So if you look at the chart on the right, and the right hand most bar, so the lightest green, is people over the age of 65. And basically, you'll see that bar just increases. So again, these are projections, but um, within 10 years, it's expected that the population of Rentham, 30% of the population will be over 65 years old. And the map, and uh, we certainly, um, encourage feedback on the maps and, and we can give draft maps to everyone so that we make sure that they're accurate based on your knowledge of town. Um, but the yellow shows residential land uses. The green is basically open space, whether parks or protected forests. Uh, the pinkish color is commercial and industrial. So you'll see that, you know, south of 495, um, the outlets, and then along Route 1. Um, so there's a lot of residential use. You can kind of see the centers of activity in town. Okay, so now I'm interested in everyone's reactions. So um, I'm gonna turn off the screen share again and we can have a short discussion about anything that you learned or you think is notable. I was surprised by the number of rented houses. Myself. You thought that it, it was fewer than that? Yeah, I really had no clue. How does that compare to the state or the, the country as a whole? Is that a typical number or is that a high or a low number? Well, it really depends on geography, obviously. The more urban areas have more renters. Um, and I don't recall what it was for the sub-region, so we can certainly compare it. I don't know if you know off the top of your head, Ralph. I, I don't know the answer uh, off the top of my head, um, but uh, as Ella pointed out, certainly in more of our, uh, in the more urban communities, we're going to see much higher percentages of uh, renters. So for instance, Revere, which is very different from Rentham, when we did the Revere plan, it was almost a 50-50 split between the renters and uh, the homeowners. Um, and then, you know, suburban towns tend to be in between, then you get into some even more affluent uh, communities and you may find that there's only five or ten percent rental uh, properties and uh, you know it's, I think part of it is uh, also the split of single family homes versus other types of, uh, of homes so in communities where you see a lot more uh, multifamily or uh, duplexes or triplexes a lot of those are rental not necessarily uh, condominium ownership type properties. Um, so um, in those types of communities where you have a lot of single family homes, you're gonna have a lot more home ownership because there's very little single family housing stock that is rented. But and we can, right uh, down, what's that? Well, I was gonna say right down the street for me where I live, there's uh, about a hundred units of apartments coming online that mm -hmm. are currently under construction. So that'll just, that'll add to that demographic. That's a 40B project, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and uh, when the 2020 census uh, numbers come out, um, that whole subsidized housing number is going to look different. It'll be interesting, not just in Rentham, but across the state, uh, where communities stand vis-a-vis -vis that 10% threshold. So, um, you know, if you've seen a lot of development in the last 10 years of any kind in Rentham, uh, that may change that 13%, uh, but 
you know, if you're still seeing other 40B projects being built, then, uh, you know, maybe you'll, you'll still maintain uh, a number that's above 10%. I thought it was interesting that the population has been increasing so rapidly, but the number, the percentage of households with kids is actually decreasing. I would think those would be sort of a direct relationship. And the fact that the population by age group is the way it is over the next 20 years, does that imply that people are, were moving to town 30 years ago, raising their families, their kids have now moved away and they're empty nesters, but have no intention of going anywhere? That's what we see in a lot of similar towns, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting that uh, even in communities where we see population decreasing, we still are seeing an increase in the number of households because of uh, families that are delaying having kids um, and then just the aging demographic uh, where you have a lot more uh, single and two family, uh, single and two person households, um, just because uh, the baby boomers are all getting older. The uh, that same chart where it showed the thirty percent over sixty five by the end of this decade, is that on par with what the national averages are? Is that pretty much where that demographic lies? I don't know about national average, although I think that the country isn't aging, but certainly the state is aging and certainly the region is. Yeah, I, I think that that, you know, the percentages may vary, but the basic trend is the same. Um, so the baby boom generation is still in the middle of turning 65 and that means that uh, 10,000 people a day across the country are turning 65 every day. And when you add all of that up, it's 79 million people. Um, so clearly that's tilting things on that end of the scale. But then um, the millennials are, um, you know, within a few years are gonna outnumber the baby boomers. So we're that, seeing a couple of different mm -hmm. trends happening. So wh what has your experience been in, in uh, how those trends influence uh, master plans? You, you know, are we, are we taking into account the aging and aging population? Or are we trying to, you know, design this to accommodate and provide the goods and services and the vehicles and the means for that to happen? Or, or do you, or do you just try to find a balance and you know assume that maybe those trends will reverse or change over the years? What what has been your experience in some of the communities that you're working in? So I think we present this data to do just that to make sure that we're planning for the people who we expect to be living in Rentham and their particular needs. Um, so in terms of baby boomers, that can look like. Um, in terms of like open space and recreation, having more places to walk that are safe and maybe shady and provide benches rather than um, adult sports because people over 65 might be playing less adult sports and want more places to walk. Or in terms of housing, uh, there might be greater need for smaller housing or maybe, you know, maybe condos that require less upkeep and that don't have so many bedrooms so that um, seniors who raise their family, maybe in a four bedroom house, can stay in town, but don't need all that space any longer. And then in terms of millennials, we see um, a different preference in lifestyle. So millennials and also seniors wanting um, more walkable towns. So be able to um, walk to work or walk to a cafe or walk to a restaurant. Um, less preference for owning and driving vehicles, um, a, a need for starter homes, again, a need for smaller or more diverse housing options so that uh, millennials can afford that first home. Do you want to add anything, Ralph? Um, the only other thing I would add, I guess, is uh, just to keep in mind that when we do a plan like this, the typical planning horizon is maybe 10 or 15 years. 
So uh, we'll be looking to try and accommodate those demographic changes over that uh, period of time. So, you know, as Ella mentioned, we'll be looking at all of those uh, different things, um, but not just for a single uh, demographic, but for, uh, for a variety of different demographic uh, changes. I just have a quick question on um, the age trends of households with seniors versus with children. Are you also accounting for households with seniors and with children, of like millennials who have their parents moving with them or millennials moving in with their parents, like ra raising their kids with their senior citizen parents? Um, from what I heard, the Park Street um, development, Lafayette, et cetera, I was speaking to a, a realtor there who said that about 25% of the houses that he was selling or having built um, had in-law apartments where their parents were gonna be moving in with the buyers and the, the parents actually help fund um, the purchase of the house. Um, have you been seeing that trend elsewhere? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I think that's a, that's a great example of how the changing demographics can change the preferences for certain types of housing and what housing needs to be developed. And um, I'm not familiar with the Rentham accessory dwelling unit bylaw, but it sounds like those in-law apartments are allowed and, and maybe how can we better ensure that the zoning um, meets those demands. I think that, yeah, we've seen similar um, desire across the region. I have a question. Um, and the commute, um, what, what, are, what are those numbers based on? It seems unlikely to me that almost 7,000 people are driving to rent them to work. I don't, I don't, I can't even imagine where they'd be working. Well, Everett, yeah. I think the, the, the outlets obviously is a large commute. Um, we have a lot of people from Rhode Island coming in from there. There's also the development center and the three uh, major nursing homes in the town. I think that they bring a lot of outside uh, workers in. That data is from the census, but we can try to dig into it more and see where those people are, are working based on what George just tested. I mean, I, no, sorry. So go, no, go please. Yeah. Uh, I live in West Rentham, right on the uh, Cumberland line. I can tell you, it's like an invasion every morning from Rhode Island. It's a steady stream coming up 121. So. Yeah, it was kind of surprising that uh, precious few people actually who live in town work in town. And I suppose in part that has a lot to do with the availability of industries and jobs and that sort of thing. I mean, you know, relatively speaking or percentage wise, is this sort of a typical percentage for a town this size? Um, or is this on the lower end of the spectrum? What has been your experience on that? Do you want to do that, Ralph? Uh, can't give you anything really precise. Um, but, you know, I think it, it may depend upon uh, overall location. So, you know, if, if we were talking about a community that was much closer to Boston, um, you know, I think we'd see a lot more, uh, a lot higher number for people commuting outside of that individual city or town and heading into Boston. Um, but, uh, you know, for a community that is a largely residential, community that does not have a particularly strong commercial or industrial base, it's not unusual to see uh, a relatively small number for people who live and work in the same community. And I think from what I've seen over the years that most of that employment is probably related to the municipal government, whether it's public safety people or people who work for the school department. Um, but a lot of the people that tend to live and work in the same town, uh, you know, I think there's usually a pretty high percentage of people in that situation who are working in local government. I had a quick question if I could. Oops, sorry.
Go for it, Jeff. Is that any better? No, there's still an echo. I'll, I'll, I'll mute. You can type your chat into question, uh, type your question into the chat box and we can read it off. Does anyone else have any comments or questions before we move on? There's, there's something I'd like to get out there and I don't know where this knowledge went, but when we were going to put the CVS store and remove the environmental damage that had been caused by that mobile gas station about 12 years ago, um, CBS was going to pay for a traffic light because the state did a study and said at that time that there needed to be a traffic light to stop traffic between Wampum Corner, which many of us remember when there wasn't a traffic light at Wampum Corner, and 1A and 140. So I just, and I, since we have people that have a say in future development, I don't know where that knowledge went, but I can tell you there are people at CVS laughing over the fact that Cumberland Farms, and at the time it was a VP at Cumberland Farms who used to work at CVS. And I, I, I don't know where I was, that was approved so quickly, but you know, I know there's been a lot of accidents. The traffic is terrible between 1A and 140 in Wampum Corner. So I would just urge whoever is, has a say in these things, these developers, these national the companies that are coming into town, they will pay, it's very common to pay for traffic lights. So please don't let that happen again because we are going to have someone, it, you cannot take a left out of Creek Street onto 1A either during school uh, let out school in the morning or afternoon. Obviously, it's gotten a little bit less right now with school closed um, or any time during the commuting traffic. And I think a lot of the people who are coming from Sheldonville area, they're trying to get to 495. That's, you know, because they're going into Boston or somewhere to commute. So just, just something to please keep in mind, whoever has a say in that. Well, Thank I'll you. tell you. Uh, I'm on the planning board. Okay. And I was involved in that project. By the way, we're neighbors, Steve. You're on Hate Woods. This is, yeah. Yes, right. I'm right. on Oak Point. Yep. And you need to understand that we had no say in a lot of that because it's the state that worries about that road. Mm -hmm. And we had similar discussions about it as well. And we actually had a slightly different traffic plan in there and the state changed it without us even having a word on it. So the simple answer is we don't. The state so, is the one that runs that. 12 years ago, they said there needed to be a traffic light. That's impossible with the increased traffic. But anyway, I told, I mean, the, the study was done and CVS was gonna pay the half million dollars to have it at the end of Randall Road. So, yeah, it's, it's Thank a shame. You. I think that's a really good segue into the next part of the presentation, which is about on existing plans to make sure we're not reinventing any wheels or forgetting any of the work that has already been done. Um, Jeff, Ella, did I you see? see? Yeah. Okay. I was yeah, going to Jeff's point to comment. Um, will we be able to look at other municipalities to compare the percentage of um, people who are over 55 um, housing options and resulting demographic breakdown? Um, so we should talk about that later and make sure that I understand, but certainly we can uh, also curious on the he's adding also curious on the demographics of similar towns that have available professional and technical businesses in town in comparison to rent them. That may be one of our goals to track the dig more into the data and compare it to other municipalities in the sub region to provide greater context for some of these numbers. And um, Yeah, one thing that we um, might want to discuss at some point is, uh, you know, when Ella uh, did this presentation. She compared Rentham with 
you know, some of the communities that surround the town. Um, we may decide down the road that uh, it, we, we could pick and choose communities so that the comparison is a little, uh, you know, is, is more relevant to the town. If, if you want to do that, uh, you know, master plans are done in a number of different ways. And certainly we've done a number of them where we just looked at the surrounding communities, but sometimes we've worked on plans where we've uh, sort of handpicked the communities that we would compare, rent them with. Um, so, uh, you know, typically when a master plan project is done, there is some sort of comparison between the, the subject community and, uh, and others just to provide context. So that's something we can talk about more as we get into the project. Great, that's the idea. So uh, Rachel is taking notes, thank you Rachel. Can we make sure that we have Jeff's question? Great. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm going to go into some of the existing plans, and I don't see there are a lot of there are a couple studies about Route One and Route One A. I hadn't seen anything about the South Light and CDS, so maybe we can add that to the list of historical resources that we'd be sure to build on. So I'm just going to start uh, sharing my screen again. Okay, so um, again, the goal of this is to make sure that we're not reinventing the wheel and that nobody's work was done in vain so that we can be as effective and efficient in this planning process. So the last master plan was written in 2004, so 17 years ago. And um, this is the vision statement. I actually think it's worthwhile just reading aloud. So we'll be revisiting this and seeing if this still reflects the community's desires. Um, the town of Rentham seeks to actively preserve its New England charm and character through conservation of rural areas and its village center while pursuing a defined development strategy. It is our vision that the town of Rentham maintain and enhance a high quality of life and be affordable for all of its residential and corporate citizens. Rentham citizens, their elected boards and appointed committees will be guided by this vision. Another plan, um, which I believe all these resources, oh no, I don't think they have them, but I can add all these resources to the share file so that we can all access and reference these. But it has a lot of objectives. Um, some of them that I thought I'd bring your attention to include directing growth to village centers. So the 2004 master plan calls for channeling growth to five centers, downtown, Rentham Development Center, Wampum's Corner, Sheldonville, and the Backlands near the Rentham Premium Outlet. So that can be something we can consider um, moving forward, whether that still reflects the community's needs. Um, protecting open space and rural character. Um, I think we lost your audio again, Ella. Can you hear me? Now I can. Okay, sorry about that. Um, conducting a Route 1A study, which you'll see was conducted. Um, another plan is in its draft stages, almost finalized. That's the open space and recreation plan. So likely some of you have been involved in that. Um, Rentham is rich in protected open space, almost 5,000 acres. Um, and the goals of this plan um, include protecting the watershed, rural view sheds, um, habitat and wildlife corridors, as well as investing in re recreation facilities and programs. Another plan that we can build on was conducted a couple years ago, the MVP or Municipal Vulnerability Plan. So this is part of a state-wide uh, program to help towns plan uh, to be prepared for climate impacts. And so 
uh, based on the process in 2018, the greatest hazard in Rentham is inland flooding. And the plan identifies some strengths in addition to that. Uh, I Lost your audio. Yeah. So, um, kind of targeting resources on protecting the most vulnerable from climate impacts. So, uh, uh, oftentimes these are seniors. So, one of the recommendations in the plan is to increase the senior center size. And then, how the environment will be impacted by climate. So, recommendations are about um, stormwater bylaws and restoring the lake ecological systems. Similarly, there was a hazard mitigation plan that had uh, similar findings and recommendations really focused on the risk of inland flooding. Some folks have already mentioned this, but NAPC was involved in a zoning project a couple years ago for the downtown. Um, working with the town to think about how to develop that space that was earlier referenced of the vacant, uh, the vacant site kind of behind near Sweat Park. Um, so the zoning calls for uh, or allows for new uses, mixed uses, and kind of extending the historic village center block structure into that vacant area to uh, improve walkability and and enhance the character of the downtown. So this will be cer certainly part of the master plan process and something we want to build off of. As I mentioned, there is a study of Route 1. And um, oh, that's the wrong picture. Anyways, there is a study of Route 1 and the potential for more commercial development and how that would improve the tax base for the town. But how that, that's a, to, please. That's actually Route 1A that you're looking at. No, I'm sorry about that. That's the wrong picture, yeah. Um, so how to encourage new commercial development to improve tax base, the tax base, but then how to accommodate traffic and, and what kind of engineering improvements are needed if there's going to be new development along Route 1. And here's where it should be. Uh, there is also Route 1A corridor study, so a lot of these issues that you're bringing up, Diane, might be in these two studies. So this acknowledged the high crash rate and um, safety problems along 1A and included engineering recommendations um, specifically around the commons, um, around that intersection at Creek Street, um, new sidewalks, new multimodal walking and biking improvements. Um, and likely many of you know more details about this, but this could be something something that we should look at and build off of. And then while uh, the most recent housing production plan was <clears throat> performed 16 years ago. So you know, addressed a very different uh, state of the town. But at that point, um, there were 147 affordable units. And to meet this 10% threshold, the town needed to build 200 more, or the town needed 200 more. So obviously a lot of affordable units have been built since this last housing production plan. <clears throat> but at that point, there was, um, it was identified that many more affordable units were needed for a broad swath of the community. No. I think all they can see is me. Okay, and then the last thing I just wanted to acknowledge is that all of this data is before COVID and the devastation that that has brought to our communities and how that has changed everything really. So unfortunately, we know little, um, you know, from the data about exactly how that has changed conditions, but MAPC has done some research and Obviously, we're all suffering, suffering um, in a variety of ways. One, in employment and jobs. And the loss of jobs is really focused 
on certain occupations. So 40% of the job loss in Massachusetts is in these three occupations of food, office and admin, and sales. And specifically, a quarter of the people who work in sales, we estimate, have been laid off in the past couple months. And as you recall, as you know, a lot of the job, a lot of the job people are working with them are in these same sectors. So we don't have the data, you know, we'll learn more through the public participation process, but likely both the residents <clears throat> of Rentham as well as the employers have been hit really hard. Um, so I thought that we could just spend a couple of minutes reflecting on these plans. We're almost getting to three and um, we'll, we'll stop on time. But are there any um, reactions or comments or questions about uh, these plans and how we can best build off of them to make sure the master plan meets the community's needs? Or is it um, possible to get copies of those plans? Yeah, so they're all available, but I will upload them all to that share file resource so that they're all in one place. I'm going to include a link. We have them all on the planning board studies and reports webpage, but yes, you can also have them available there. Oh, you know what? They're also all on the webpage that we just developed. So that's probably the easiest. Oh, yeah. How frequently do towns typically update master plans? Is 15, 16 years a long time in between, or is that average? You know, we're required to do it every 10 years, but there's no enforcement. Right. <laughs> um, I would say if I had to average, uh, based on my experience, 15 years is probably uh, an average. Um, as a planner, I would ideally prefer to see plans updated every 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, Rhode Island had a state statute where uh, when it was first passed, they were requiring cities and towns to update their plan every five years. Um, but they've backed off on that and now require it every 10 years. Any other questions or comments? I have a question. Please. Um, the website link that um, Rachel sent to us, is that just a private website or is that a public, publicly accessible website? That is a publicly accessible website. So it was just finished yesterday, the web page, so it hasn't been shared, but you are free to share it with um, anyone you would like at this point. And then the next master plan committee meeting will be really focused on how to get the word out. Okay. Great. Okay. Well, we've, we've uh, gone through a lot of data today. Um, so the last thing before we get into next steps is just Anything else that we wanted to share as we kind of set our vision of what success looks like for this plan? Already there's been some ideas um, and discussion, but anything else that you want to state and you want to share of what success looks like for you? I, I'd just like to add um, or mention, I think community notification um, is very important. And the last master plan, I think, um, and Jerry can speak to this better, but there's a rumor going around that Rental was going to start putting in uh, sewers. And that caused an uh, um, outcry and really shut down the whole um, plan. So I think community notification, keeping them not necessarily involved, but at least knowledgeable about what, what's going on to, to quality rumors is, is very important as we move forward. Well, again, for longtime residents, we had a chance at town meeting to get half state funding. Anyone else remember this for sewer? Sewers around in the downtown, which would have helped with all this development. 
Um, it's one of the reasons commercial buildings in downtown, you know, we could have, could have had more restaurants, but um, around in the downtown and around the three lakes. Does anybody else remember that? And the state was gonna pay for half of it. And at town meeting, back then, there weren't as many, I guess, families with young kids that came out to vote and they voted it down. I mean, that would have been amazing to have that funding, but I'm sure there's no funding for such a thing now. Yeah, Ella, you'll find it on our webpage. We were part of the smart sewering um, study too. And okay. I think it's same, Littleton had also done it, I think at the same time. Um, and yes, to her point, from what I've heard, it was um, not looked not looked well on by other um, people in the community. So it was going to increase taxes, and they just it, it was. I remember the vote wasn't that far apart, but um, people just didn't want the taxes increased, which were increased anyway. Over <laughs> such a shame. I don't know. I, I'm from that area near Littleton, and I don't know if any of you have ever been up, been there for a while, but that area has like tripled in size in terms of commercial development right at 495. That town is just, you know, putting the money in their pocket big time because of that. I want to read out some comments from Jeff. Uh, definitely use the impacts of COVID-19 to help guide our future path would also be curious on municipal and business and or intertown partnerships, looking at Patriots and Foxborough. I was on that committee and it's important that facts and not fearful information is provided, echoing what George said. I think we have time for one last comment of what success would look like to you for this plan. Yes, I have a question. Um, at isn't on what the study should look like, but information that would be interesting to me anyway. Uh, is there any source of how many acres of Rentham is uh, consumed by roadways? I know that the miles of roadways is easily obtainable, but to convert that into acres uh, would be a long process unless somebody else has already done it. I don't think that's readily available, but we could certainly look at, um, I think we can look at impervious services. So that would be a lot more than just roadways, but we could also just do some simple math and multiply the miles. By uh, it just, and the amount of available space that is available is severely restricted by the amount of acres that are already consumed by roadways. Uh, when you look at the total acres of Rentham, um, you would have to delete that as unusable space, uh, just like streams and lakes and wetlands. So like really looking at how much um, vacant land is actually developable and uh, yes. accounting for how much of that is already used for roads. Yeah. Right. That would affect my view on what, whether or not we should change and look at any zoning as part of this master plan. Okay, great. Um, well, we just have a couple more minutes here. In terms of next steps, I hope to have another committee meeting soon. Um, and again, Carolina will be here and lead the discussion on community engagement so that we can really start this outreach and transparent communication to the public. Um, NAPC will start drafting a survey. So again, um, we, we build in public uh, feedback as soon as possible. And um, so we'll start drafting that survey and share it with you for your feedback as well. Um, are there any other next steps, Rachel, about um, uh, swearing in that you wanted to share or anything else from the town? Um, I don't know, have all of you been reached out or contacted by either um, Cindy Thompson or Kevin Sweet to get sworn in? No. Awesome. I called I called her this morning and she says she doesn't have the list of committee members yet. Okay. Cindy doesn't. Okay. 
I will follow up and um, get you all an answer um, on next steps on that by tomorrow. Um, right now, we are still not open to the public, but certain committees or certain, sorry, departments are um, being allowed to have appointments. So that's probably what will happen is it'll be an appointment um, and you'll come to either the front door or the side door and she'll swear you in that way. Um, you know, don't hold me to it, but uh, we'll see how that's gonna go. And then also for those of you that are already on committees, I don't uh, know what that means. If you have to get re-sworn in or, you know, whatever. But again, I'll find out those specifics and uh, get back to you. Um, it's three now, so probably I'll say by tomorrow um, afternoon on that part. And then do we have a, seeing as hopefully our next meeting will all be sworn in, um, my next question would be, these will be open to the public at that point. Um, and do we want to have these at a later time? And what time, evening time works best for you all? I wonder since there's so many people on here, if we could uh, use, do that through email and, and try to gather everyone's votes of what time works best. That's okay. I think it might be hard to narrow down a time. Um, thank you everyone so much. It was an hour and a half on a warm afternoon and I realized that um, Zoom meetings are rarely fun. So I hope that we all learned something and got to know each other a little bit better and we will try our best to build the cohesion of this group so that we're productive and helpful serve the town as best we can, but I really appreciate your time and your service. Um, thank you very much. You all have my email, which has my number, so please give me a call with any questions. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Nice meeting. Oh, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.